So will you please give a warm welcome to Stephen King, who hopefully is going to predict it with far greater accuracy than that committee did then. Well, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I should say that uh, rather than the Chinese are coming, uh, the Chinese have arrived. Um, they've had a huge impact on the global economy uh, over the last few years. Um, in fact, I go to China quite a lot, um, roughly speaking, once or twice a year, and have been doing so for the last 10 or 12 years or so. And I often go to Shanghai. And Shanghai is um, an extraordinary city, in particular because of the way in which uh, the developments on the Pudong side of the river um, has taken off um, like a rocket. In fact, there's a building there that looks just like a rocket, um, which is one of the most memorable uh, pictures you see of, of Shanghai uh, from time to time. Um, and um, I, I normally stay in, the, uh, in the, the Grand Hyatt Hotel when HSBC sends me over to Shanghai. And the Grand Hyatt Hotel is at the top of the Jin Mao Tower, which for a while was, in fact, the tallest building um, in Shanghai. Um, and I was typically staying on level 80 or 85, so uh, when it wasn't cloudy, you get a fantastic view um, over Shanghai. Um, and on one occasion, a couple of years back, I, uh, I sort of was glancing at this view as I came out of the shower completely naked, um, only to see looking through the window uh, a group of Chinese construction workers. Um, this was a bit of a surprise given I was on about the 85th floor, but um, they were building the uh, World Financial Center right next door. Um, and the pace of change in China over the course of the last few years um, has been that extraordinary. I, I also should say that um, I really hope that the Chinese construction workers, having seen me, uh, didn't decide to jump off the building um, because things might have been rather unpleasant. Anyway, I thought I'd uh, kick off with some very simple observations. Um, going back to the theme of China, uh, the 19th century um, arguably belonged to Britain um, and to the British Empire, and it all fell apart. Um, in the 20th century. Um, the 20th century, as it seems to have turned out, belonged to the United States. There are lots of rivals, lots of rival philosophies, lots of rival ideas through the 20th century. But by the end of the 20th century, it seemed as though the US, in one sense, had won. Uh, its model of liberal democracy, its model of free markets had won, in some sense. What I'd like to argue is that the 21st century uh, belongs to China belongs to India, in fact, belongs to a number of what we might describe as emerging nations, uh, including some in Latin America, uh, including some in the Middle East, maybe eventually including some in Africa. Um, that much, in one sense, is not particularly controversial. I think people do accept that things are changing, uh, that Europe, in one sense, has lost its way. It's not growing as quickly as it used to be. Uh, that the US is having some teething difficulties currently, and that countries like China and India are growing at a rate of knots which means that over 20, 30, 40 years, they will catch up, in one sense, with the size of uh, Western economies. What I think is not so well understood, and this is going to be the topic of my talk this afternoon, is the disruptive nature of this shift in the baton of economic power uh, from one nation or group of nations to another. It's very easy to say that China will do well in the 21st century in the way that the US had done well in the 20th century, but how do we shift from one particular paradigm, one particular view of the world, one dominant superpower, to another? Uh, what does that shift entail? What might we experience as a result um, of that shift? And I wanted to uh, quote something from John Maynard Keynes uh, from his um, Economic Consequences of the Peace, which was written during the Treaty of Versailles, just after the First World War. And he rather lampooned um, the, the sort of feelings that British people had uh, just before the First World War came about, because people really didn't predict the First World War. It wasn't expected. This is a very famous quote. You may have heard it before, so apologies for those who have heard it. They said the following. They said, the inhabitants of London in 1914 could order by telephone, sipping his morning tea in bed, uh, the various products of the whole earth in such quantity as he might see fit, and reasonably expect that early delivery upon his doorstep. He could at the same time and by the same means adventure his wealth in the natural resources and new enterprises of any quarter of the world, and share without exertion or even trouble in their prospective fruits and advantages. The projects and politics of militarism and imperialism, of racial and cultural rivalries, of monopolies, restrictions, and exclusion were little more than the amusements of his daily newspaper. 
and appear to exercise almost no influence at all on the ordinary course of social and economic life, the internationalization of which was nearly complete in practice. Before the First World War, globalization, if I can call it that term, uh, was something that was taken uh, for granted. It was seen to be something that was a natural consequence of the, of the events of the 19th century. It was something that would continue indefinitely because it will be exceedingly irrational for countries uh, which were so dependent upon each other uh, economically to think about going to war or to do something that was sufficiently disruptive to put the world into reverse. And yet, just a few months afterwards, we found the world collapsing into a complete heap with wars, uh, with depressions, with all sorts of things that seemed to be eminently unpredictable um, at the end of the 19th century. And it seems to me that today there's the same kind of complacency um, about globalization. It's a complacency which is really, I think, based on the idea that, in a sense, globalization is a Western project, whether for good or for ill. For good, the argument goes as follows, that globalization effectively spreads liberal democracy, um, it spreads free markets from the Western world into other parts of the world. And if it's true um, that uh, the liberal democracy and free markets were the big secret of Western success over the last two or three hundred years, it should follow that other countries also can benefit. So what's been good news for the minority of the world's population over the last two or three hundred years will become good news for the majority of the world's population in the future. Everyone wins from this particular version um, of the globalization story. The second and uh, alternative Western uh, explanation is to say that globalization really is simply a mechanism uh, for Western multinationals to exploit scarce resources elsewhere in the world, to take advantage of cheap labor in other parts of the world uh, to effectively allow the West to live a life of luxury. In these circumstances, the West effectively is draining resources from other parts of the world. I think both of these particular models of globalization for good or ill um, are basically wrong. They're wrong because globalization isn't just a story about exploitation, isn't just a story about um, the efficient allocation of resources. It's also a story about the distribution um, of those resources. It's a story about income distribution, about wealth distribution. And here the West, I think, um, actually does face some significant vulnerabilities um, in the years ahead. One way you could describe this is to suggest that the West, having had many, many years of economic success, having generated year upon year upon year of continued economic expansion, is in some sense now beginning to lose control of the global economic and financial agenda. And by losing control, I mean really that countries like China, India, and Brazil are beginning to exert their own influences on the global economy in a way that actually the West is finding it increasingly difficult to cope with. The West hasn't had the proper debate as yet as to what the impact ultimately will be of these major new emergent superpowers. Why do I think that? Well, I, I think there are two key reasons behind this. Um, the first one is the fact that if you look at the way in which Western growth has come through over the last two or three hundred years, it's been mostly a story about uh, continued improvements in technology. What that basically means is that we're able to produce more and more outputs from given inputs. And therefore, we're able to live a life of greater and greater prosperity without necessarily using up the world's natural resources. Uh, and you can see it's time after time after time with all sorts of revolutions in terms of technology. Think about the, the first steam trains and compare them with uh, the Shinkansen system um, in Japan currently. Uh, think about the first aeroplanes and compare them with the uh, Airbus A380 extraordinary changes in technology which allow all of us to live better lives than has been the case in the past. But today when we see economic growth in the world, it isn't just a story about technology improvement of the kind that we've seen over the last two or three hundred years. It's also a story about the continued and increasing replication of existing technologies to more and more countries. A way to think about this is through the uh, airline industry. Um, if you take, for example, the improvements and the efficiency which we fly people around the world. And it's the case today that um, the cost of transferring the passenger from city to city is about one quarter the cost of what it would have been back in the 1950s. The cost per passenger has gone down, therefore the efficiency with which we actually push people around the world has gone up dramatically. 
However, at the same time, the number of passengers traveling around the world has gone up sevenfold um, over the same period of time. So the cost per passenger um, has come down over the last 50 or 60 years. The total cost of transferring all those passengers around has actually gone up. And the reason for that, in a sense, is that other nations around the world have got access to air travel in a way they couldn't have dreamt about maybe 40 or 50 years ago. The second big disruption that's come through, apart from this increased demand for raw materials associated with uh, heightened air travel, is disruption coming through in global labor markets. Um, if you go back over the last 50, 60 years, um, you'll find that, um, for the most part, global labor markets were remarkably detached. Uh, the US labor market, the European labor market, were not affected by developments in China, uh, but they are now. The whole process of outsourcing and offshoring is something which has become a dramatic and new theme uh, for the late 20th century and the beginnings of the 21st century. And what that means is that increasingly workers in the West are not just competing with each other for the best jobs, they're increasingly competing with workers who come from China, from India, from Brazil, who frankly are prepared to work at much lower wages than might be the case in the Western world um, today. Why has this happened? Well, I think there are a number of reasons. The, the first reason um, is to do with, with openness. It's really the, the sense that the emerging world is not now much more engaged with the West uh, than had been the case um, in the past. And the openness comes from two different sources. The first, again, is technology. The extraordinary collapse in the price of communications around the world has meant that companies in particular can invest much more easily in far-flung parts of the world that they couldn't even think about 40 or 50 years ago. So one of the really big stories in China, for example, over the last 30 years has been not just the influx of cheap Chinese labor, but also the ability of China to attract Western capital. Much of China's growth over the course of the last 20 or 30 years has come from a combination of Western multinationals investing in China and taking advantage of that cheap Chinese labor. It's a very big change as a result of new technologies. The, the second big change that's come through is politics, and in particular the politics of openness. Uh, and there are two big things, of course, that have happened over the last 20 or 30 years. The first one is the collapse of the Berlin Wall. And I would argue more important than that uh, were the reforms that came through from China um, under Deng Xiaoping. What he did was really a change of epic proportions in Chinese history. China had been cut off uh, from the Western world, uh, cut off for its own devices, really, since the 1400s. By being cut off, it didn't take advantage of all the benefits that came through in the West in terms of the Renaissance, the Reformation, uh, the Enlightenment. It didn't get the technological uh, improvements coming through in the way we saw in the West. And the consequence was that by the beginning of the 20th century, per capita incomes in China weren't really very much higher than they had been back in the 14th or 15th centuries, whereas, of course, per capita incomes in the West had grown enormously. What China, therefore, has achieved since the reforms of Deng Xiaoping is nothing short of extraordinary. We've been through 30 years of economic growth in China of a pace that we've never seen before at any point in economic history. It's been a remarkable transformation. My description of the buildings in Shanghai is only one small part of this extraordinary story that's come through um, over the last three or four decades. It's also worth noting, I think, that by the 19th century, uh, China had begun to be kicked around by the Western powers. And this reveals something about the West's success in terms of its economic progress over the last three or 400 years. It wasn't just a story about uh, liberal democracy or about free markets. It was also a story about the ability to exploit resources in other parts of the world, uh, whether it be natural resources, whether it be slavery, uh, all these kinds of things were absolutely vital in explaining the, the leaps forward that came through in the West from the 16th, 17th centuries onwards. And by the 19th century, the West was very happy, uh, in effect, to kick other countries around uh, for its own, not so much sure pleasure is quite the right word, but certainly for its own power and influence in other parts of the world. When you look at Shanghai today, you've got these incredible tall Chinese buildings um, on one side um, of the river. On the other side of the river, you've got the Bund. And the Bund, effectively, is a series of buildings by the Americans, uh, by the British, uh, by the Germans, by the Russians, uh, in the 19th and 20th centuries, uh, which effectively turned Shanghai into a kind of a playground uh, for Western uh, businessmen and Western diplomats. 
uh, rather than being something which was key for China itself. And one big change that's come through as a result of China's success over the last 30 or 40 years is that in one sense, China is trying to avoid being kicked around again. This is the rise of Chinese nationalism that's come through associated with the desire to avoid the problems that came through um, in the 19th century. The third key change um, alongside um, the technology and the openness is demographics. This is a very important theme for the future. Um, for the past, demographics has been important because it, it helps to explain in part uh, some of Asia's success over the last 50 or 60 years. I talked about this tremendous period of growth for China over the last three decades or so. But of course, it came through earlier in Asia, in Japan and South Korea. It's now beginning to come through in India and in other parts of Asia, which are still very, very poor. And this demographic trick, in one sense, is again part of the secret of Asia's and indeed emerging market success more broadly. And the trick works as follows. In the 1950s, uh, in Asia, life expectancy uh, was only about 43 or 44. It was actually very, very similar to life expectancy um, in Africa today. Life expectancy in Asia nowadays is up to about 75 or 80. It's been a remarkable transformation in a relatively short space of time. But this transformation has been very, very important because as life expectancy rises, and in Asia's case it rose largely through improvements in healthcare, uh, through vaccinations, for example, um, through um, uh, antibiotics and improvements in sanitation and so on and so forth. As life expectancy went up, the incentive to get educated also began to rise significantly. This is a brutal truth, but if your life expectancy is only about 40 or so, there isn't much point in investing in a degree or a postgraduate degree because the returns you get from your degree, frankly, are rather low. You drop dead too soon. If, however, you live until you're 60 or 70, the returns you get from your degree are relatively high. So the consequence of seeing rising life expectancy is that people have a stronger incentive to get a decent education. As education improvement improves, and educational attainment begins to improve, so the productivity of workers also begins to improve. And as the productivity improves, of course, the workers become increasingly competitive. So in one sense, over the last 50 or 60 years, Asia has been on a transformational path associated not just with technology and openness, but also with demographics. I mention this because over the next 30 or 40 years, demographics will be one of the biggest changes that we're going to see um, in the world economy. Uh, big, not so much from the point of view of the relative size of populations, but also the relative size of populations of working age. In the West, particularly in parts of continental Europe, the working age population uh, will shrink dramatically um, over the next 30 or 40 years whereas the working age population in the emerging and less developed world uh, will increase dramatically. Not so much in China because of its one-child policy, which provides a lid in terms of the growth of the population of the working age, but certainly in India, in the Middle East, in sub-Saharan Africa, there will be enormous increases in the population of working age. And that matters because over the next 30 or 40 years, uh, the Western world, with its ageing populations, with its increase in pensioners, will increasingly become dependent on trying to find out where youthful populations will be uh, that can actually look after people in their old age. And those youthful populations increasingly will not come from the West, they'll come from the emerging world. That raises all sorts of questions about what happens with immigration policy uh, over the next few years, what happens in terms of capital flows around the world. These are all big issues that have to be confronted um, in the years ahead. What we end up with as a result of all this, I think, are a paradox and a problem. The paradox of the story I've outlined uh, runs as follows. That globalization, in one sense, is fantastic. Because what it does is it narrows income and wealth inequality between nations. The gap between the US, Europe, China, and India is gradually closing. It's closing because China and India are growing so incredibly quickly. The paradox is that although income inequality and wealth inequality is narrowing between nations, it appears to be increasing within nations. And this is most obviously true in the US, and it's most obviously true um, in Europe. And the reason why um, income inequality is increasing has got a lot to do with changes in relative prices and relative wages um, around the world. The other issue I want to raise alongside the paradox is what I call a problem. 
And the problem is this, it's rooted in the comparison between where we are today and where we were in the late 19th century. I hear lots of people telling me that actually we've gone back to a late 19th century model um, of the world economy. It's a new model of globalization which takes a leaf out of the late 19th century's book. But this is not actually quite true. It's not true because on the one hand, we have a global capital market which is much more developed than was the case in the late 19th century. The flows of savings across nations are absolutely enormous compared to what was the case at the peak of 19th century globalization. But at the same time, we have a move away from globalization in the sense that in the late 19th century, there weren't actually that many nation states. Uh, there were instead a number, a limited number, of very, very large empires. And in the late 19th century, with this combination of large empires and the single global capital market, it was quite easy to set global rules for capital. And if the rules were broken in any part of the world, well, the Royal Navy could quite happily send a gunboat down there to try and sort out the problem. Whereas now, we have a global capital market, but we have each nation desiring to have some degree of national sovereignty. And that strain between national sovereignty and the global capital market is something that will get bigger and bigger and over the course of the next few years. It raises all sorts of questions about protectionism, raises questions about uh, state capitalism, about the increased influence of, of states and nations um, on the behavior of their companies. It raises questions about the strategic interest in terms of raw materials and commodities and so on, uh, kinds of issues that we haven't seen uh, raised for really quite some time. So what are the symptoms of all this? What are the symptoms of this paradox and this problem? Well, the symptoms, most obviously, come in three short-term areas. The first is trade. Now, everyone argues that trade is good, that trade is healthy, that countries should trade with each other. And I agree with that. I think that's absolutely true. But we've, I think, lost sight of one particular aspect of trade today, which is different from the past. When we have an export from country A to country B, it isn't necessarily an export of a good from the manufacturer in country A to the consumer in country B. It may instead be the export of a factory from country A to country B, and therefore the export of jobs from country A to country B. And in those circumstances, what you find is that export growth isn't necessarily synonymous with economic success domestically. And the classic example of this over the last uh, 20 years is Japan. If you were to ask the question, which developed world nation has been the most successful um, over the last couple of decades in exporting to China, the answer is Japan, by a long way. The question is, well, if Japan's been so successful at exporting to China, which has been the fastest growing nation on Earth, why is it the Japanese economy itself is so limp? And one easy answer is that Japanese multinationals have been exporting capital uh, from Japan into China, and the consequence has been that jobs have been lost in Japan and jobs have been gained in China. Trade is not what it used to be. It's a disruptive force rather than necessarily a creative force. Second uh, symptom um, is, is capital markets. Uh, capital markets these days are increasingly distorted. In fact, capital markets increasingly these days are rigged by nation states. Well, not quite rigged, but they're heavily influenced by nation states. Uh, who's the biggest borrower in the world? It's the US, the US government, in terms of its very large budget deficit. Um, who are the biggest lenders in the world? Well, effectively, it's the Chinese state, the Saudi Arabian state, it's the Russian state. And how does that work out in terms of free markets? It's not obvious at this stage that it does work out in any particularly um, attractive way. Moreover, the excess savings have been coming through in China, Saudi, Russia, indeed Germany and Japan as well over the course of the last few years, have been typically invested in a very narrow range of Western assets, uh, in government bonds in the US, government bonds in the UK and other parts of Europe. The consequence of all this investment in these kinds of assets um, is that bond prices in the West have been unusually high, bond yields have therefore been unusually low. And what that's meant in turn is that interest rates have been unusually low, which of course contributed hugely to the housing boom and bust that's come through over the course of the last few years. Uh, the West forgot that increasingly uh, the interest rates that we take for granted as being set by our central banks are not being set by our central banks the way that they used to be. They're increasingly being influenced by the savings behavior of these now very large and sizable uh, states uh, in, in China, Russia, Saudi Arabia, and elsewhere. 
at the cost of finance in the West is increasingly being influenced by the savings behavior um, of the East. And the third symptom of all this problem um, actually comes from the fact um, that we've had low inflation in recent years. Now, in the West, central banks have been applauded for their achievement of low inflation, and in one sense, rightly so. We don't want to go back to the position of the 1970s and 1980s. But what happens if the low inflation is not a consequence of good monetary policy, but instead it's just the result of a series of shocks coming through from China, from India, and elsewhere? Shocks associated with the low production costs of manufactured goods that tend to push inflation down to lower levels than would otherwise be the case. Under those circumstances, what you find is that prices fall relative to wages. People are better off anyway. They spend relatively freely. But if you add to that by keeping interest rates unusually low, you'll have people spending too freely. And we look at the developments in Ireland and the UK and elsewhere, it is directly associated uh, with the influence of the emerging nations on the global cost of capital, the global cost of borrowing. Uh, it's something which has been poorly understood, in my view, um, in the Western world over the course of the last few years. What this all boils down to is that when you have these shocks coming through, when you have the shocks on trade, when you have the shocks coming through um, in terms of capital flows and inflation, you're talking about a world in which income has been redistributed in unexpected ways. And what this means is that in the West, we're not quite sure where we stand with regard to globalization. And here I think we're seeing a return of what you might describe as political economy uh, rather than straightforward economics. It's the distribution of the benefits of globalization that increasingly matters rather than globalization um, itself. Now, one example of this is China. China is a relatively poor country. Its incomes per capita are only about two or three thousand dollars a year. That compares with $40,000 per year in the US. China, though, is also growing incredibly quickly at a rate that I've already described as being probably the fastest in economic history. So it's been a, an extraordinary change in a relatively short space of time. When countries are poor but growing quickly, they tend to use a lot of their income to be spent on raw materials and commodities. They need roads and railways and bridges and airports and all the things that in the West we take for granted. And those, that kind of infrastructure spending requires huge amounts of metals and huge amounts of oil and energy. And so China today is the biggest consumer of metals in the world. It's also the biggest uh, or second biggest consumer of oil and at the margin of making the biggest single contribution to increases in oil demand. In fact, if you do a simple back of the envelope calculation, in 20 or 30 years' time, if China carries on growing at its current rate, it will be attempting to consume all of today's oil production, all of it all over the world. Now, of course, the chances of that happening are very, very low. Oil prices will adjust. There'll be some new technology coming through, perhaps. But the consequence of this is that China's increased oil consumption means higher fuel prices, and higher fuel prices will eat away or corrode uh, Western living standards, other things being equal. Look at the price of petrol um, at the pump. It's not just an increase in the tax, which is driving petrol prices. It's also the effect of Chinese demand coming through and disrupting the prices of energy compared to what we've seen in the past. And if you don't believe me, um, think about the experience of the last 10 years. We've just been through the deepest Western recession since the 1930s. If we'd known six or seven years ago about the depths of the Western recession, most of us would have forecast that oil prices would have come down to, I don't know, five, 10, $15 a barrel. Yet they're currently up at 70 or $80 a barrel. And one key reason behind that is a tremendous success that's come through um, in emerging nations. The second part of this political economy story really relates to the fact that um, as we see um, China's competition coming through, there will be an increased squeeze on Western wages. What I wanted to do here was to imagine yourself um, as, well, you don't have to imagine yourself, you are one of these people, uh, someone who's employed, perhaps, by a company. Maybe that company makes manufactured goods, um, that company is owned by its shareholders and perhaps you've got some shares yourself and you're also a consumer. How do you feel about globalization in these circumstances? Well, as a consumer, you may be a little bit indifferent. You see the benefits of falling manufactured goods prices because they're produced increasingly in China uh, rather than somewhere else. Uh, but at the same time, you also will see that energy prices are going up and therefore you're not quite sure what the overall impact on your real income 
um, actually is in these circumstances. So as a consumer, you're a little bit indifferent. As a shareholder, you might like the story of globalization because you think, well, if companies can uh, export their capital to China or to India and cut their costs, it means more profits for companies. That's good for me as a shareholder. That's absolutely fine. But as a worker, you may be extremely unsure as to where you stand because, of course, the danger is that it's your job that's outsourced to China or it's your job that requires a pay cut to remain competitive with what's going on in China or indeed elsewhere. The consequence of this is that in the West, you end up with, I think, a growing indifference and possibly a growing fear about globalization because of the impact of, of all these changes on income and wealth um, inequality and because we're not sure as individuals where we stand um, in this particular story. In actual fact, when you look at the experience of income inequality in the States or in the UK um, over the last 30 or 40 years, there's been a massive change and a massive increase in income inequality which in one sense, up until very recently, has gone largely unnoticed. If you look at the experience of, say, a college graduate in the US over the last 30 or 40 years, yes, it's true that their income has risen, but their income has risen nothing like as quickly um, as their productivity is picked up. In other words, they're working harder and harder, but not getting the fair increase in wages you might normally expect. And how has the US covered up this particular story? Um, how has the UK covered up the story? Well, there's a very simple answer. It's been covered up through consumer credit. When you look at consumer inequality, it's much lower than income inequality. Those who didn't see their incomes rising simply borrowed more. They were able to sustain living standards that perhaps were ultimately beyond them. And with the credit crunch that's now come through, we suddenly discover that actually the Western world is nothing like as healthy as it had been, appeared to be in the past. You have got this kind of underclass that's come through, which is growing all the time and which actually provides a significant threat to the whole process of globalization. If you want an example of this, it's in the US today. It's not so much that the unemployment rate overall is incredibly high, which it is. It's rather that the long-term unemployed, those who have been unemployed for six months or more, uh, actually are now at the highest rate uh, in the post-war period, the highest since the Depression in the 1930s. And this raises some big questions about the so-called flexibility of the US labor market. Typically, people lost their jobs but found new jobs extremely quickly thereafter. That has not been true over the course of the last two or three years. It's a break from the past, and I would argue it's part of the story about growing income inequality. So what we have is a world whereby globalization is creating, I would argue, winners and losers within nations. Um, how do these nations respond to this particular story? Well, in the Eastern world, in the emerging world, I would argue that the response has been a resort to the model of state capitalism that we saw in the UK and other nations in the 18th and 19th centuries. Uh, what the Chinese, for example, the Russians are trying to employ is a story which is rather similar to the story associated with the British East India Company, uh, which came into existence at the beginning of the 1600s and ultimately was a vehicle of, of state intervention in other parts of the world. The British East India Company, after all, was ultimately responsible for India becoming part um, of the British Empire. Now, I'm not suggesting that Russia and China are quite the same sort of thing, but their spheres of influence through commercial activities are growing all the time. Think about Gazprom's pipelines going into uh, Western Europe. It's a significant change. It means that Europe is increasingly dependent on Russian gas, but Gazprom, as a company, is 51% owned by the Russian state. And the former chief executive of Gazprom is one Dmitry Medvedev, who happens to be uh, the president of Russia today. So the connections between commercial interests and state interests in Russia are, are extremely high. As far as China is concerned, it is increasingly choosing to invest in other parts of the world to try to make sure it gets access to natural resources. And those investments include investments um, in, in parts of Africa, most obviously. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? There's a big debate about whether this is a land grab or something which ultimately benefit the, the African states themselves. But what it does suggest is that Russia and China are playing games with commodities, with raw materials, which are the kinds of games that the Western world used to play back in the 18th and 19th centuries. And this changes the global economic landscape. It means that uh, Africa, uh, Latin America, become much more closely connected with the success or failure of China and Russia, and in one sense much less connected uh, with the success or otherwise of the US um, and Europe. And as far as the Western world itself is concerned, um, 
what do we do about all this? Well, I'll make a prediction first of all. The Western world's share of global economic activity inevitably will shrink over the course of the next few years. It will shrink partly because of demographics. It will shrink partly because of the continued economic catch-up of countries like China uh, and like India um, and other parts of the emerging world. Because of that shrinkage, it will be increasingly difficult for the West to fund the things that we currently take for granted. That includes pensions. It includes military adventures. Uh, it includes all sorts of things that we funded up until now, which become increasingly difficult to fund with probably what will be a weaker long-term growth rate um, over the years to come. And the West will then face a choice. The choice, I think, is relatively straightforward. Does the West choose to grow old gracefully, accepting that the baton of economic and financial success has been passed away from the West to other parts of the world, to China, to India, and to other nations? Or instead, does it say, no, we don't like what's happening at the moment. We don't like this engagement with these countries which have different political systems to our own. We don't like what's happening. We can't impose our power on these countries anymore, but we can certainly pull away. We can disengage. That's, I think, a choice that's, that the West is facing, growing old gracefully or disengagement. And I would like to think that the West will uh, grow old gracefully for all sorts of obvious reasons, but ultimately, it's only with an engaged global economy with connections being made that you will see rising living for the majority. Not for all, but for the majority. It's only by having engagement that you can avoid the calamities that came through in the first half of the 20th century. The wars, the depressions, uh, the rivalries, the national rivalries that came through. My fear, though, it's an obvious fear from what they said, is that as a result of the growing income inequality, the growing uncertainties about globalization, the desire to blame other nations but for the difficulties the West is now going through in terms of the credit crunch, in terms of high levels of unemployment. The risk is the West will choose to disengage from China, from India, and from other nations. Most people tend to say, well, ultimately, China might go wrong, or India will go wrong. It hasn't got the Western model. But for me, the main risk of the global economy is not so much what goes wrong in China and in India. It's rather what goes wrong in the West whether the West retreats into a much more isolationist stance. And if it did, you've then got the risk of major economic calamity and also, I suppose, at the extreme, uh, the risk of heightened conflict. So on that uh, particularly cheerful note, um, I would uh, like to bring my comments to an end. Uh, thank you very much indeed. And I guess we'll hand over to the next speaker. Thank you.